The Beginner's Guide to the Spirituality and Prayer of St. Paul. I wanted to touch about on something which isn't specifically covered in the class here with this. And the, the main way to understand this is, let's go back to my, my one-sentence definition of the Bible. Who God is, who we are, and what's our relationship. Okay. And spirituality covers how we live that relationship because that relationship is supposed to be alive, right? It's not just something we read about in the book. We have a real relationship with a real Father in heaven, a real relationship with Jesus, our brother, a real relationship with the Holy Spirit. And our spirituality is that relationship. So I got this definition from the A Concise Dictionary of Theology, a systematic practice of and reflection on a prayerful, devout, and disciplined Christian life. In its practice, Christian spirituality is always called for an ascetical and prayerful life in which a spiritual guide and the light of the Holy Spirit help discern the direction in which individuals and communities are being led. So one of the key points in there is that a spiritual guide is helping us discern the direction. And the most prominent of those spiritual guides is our pastor. And then the next level up is our bishop. The next level up from that, our bishop in Rome, the pope. They are our spiritual guides in our relationship with God. Now, a couple of things before we get into um, St. Paul. I want to talk about prayer out of the catechism. Humility is the foundation of prayer. We have to know that God is there, that he is our Father, and that we need him. And as part of that need, as part of that need to be with him, need to love him, need to receive his love, we have to know we have to have a relationship with him. And that relationship through our talking with him, our prayer, we have to be humble. According to scripture, it is the heart that prays. It is out of the heart. Remember, the intellect and the will. The heart is the the part where we choose to make real what our thoughts are. So in our heart, an attribute of the soul, that's where we pray to God. <laughs> Prayer is not some chemical reaction going on inside the brain, neurons firing and all that kind of stuff. Prayer is a part of our soul in which we talk to our Father who has created our immortal soul. Christian prayer is a covenant relationship between God and man. Remember that first week when I hit you up with all that covenant theology? Huh? God is our Father. Jesus is our brother. And we have a relationship with them. And so we talk to them. And we give this talking to them and listening to them a special name we call a prayer. But that covenant relationship, there is a family that exists. In the New Covenant, prayer is the living relationship of the children of God with their Father, who is good beyond all measure with his Son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. So prayer is the living of this relationship. It's not a relationship that we read about. It's not a theoretical thing. You can't prove it with a formula like mathematics. It's a reality that we live. Okay. Now, Paul wrote 13 letters, and here's the beginning of every letter. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So every letter that he writes to communities and to individual people, he starts with this, a prayer, in which he is doing two things. Wishing them, it's a prayer of blessing, wishing them grace and peace. I don't know if you can see that, but you can see it on your handouts. So every single letter with some subtle differences in his wording, he wishes that to everyone. So it's not really a greeting. It's not like, hi, how are you? Right? Paul here is praying for them as part of his greeting. A prayer of a blessing. Grace to you and peace. Remember a few weeks ago, I talked a lot about grace, right? Hit you up with a lot of grace. Grace, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit itself is what is given in grace and the gifts that the Holy Spirit brings with him. Baptism, that'd be faith, hope, and love, the virtues. And peace. What does St. Paul say about peace? For he is our peace, that he is Jesus. What does Jesus say about peace? My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. What does Isaiah prophecy about peace? From Handel's Messiah, you've heard this. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given, and his name will be called Prince of Peace. So Paul, grace and peace to you. Peace, this gift of Jesus, an attribute of Jesus, who he is, what he is. Right? Peace is not just the absence of conflict. Peace is a, an experience, a knowledge of, a relationship with Jesus. This is Paul's blessing. Grace to you, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peace, a gift of Jesus. That's how St. Paul prays. Now, how to pray by St. Paul. I mention you always in my prayers. Paul's talking to all the people of Not all the people of Rome, but the people of Rome who are listening to his sermons read by people who are reading his letters. He sends the letter off to the church. Someone in that church reads the letter. The people there listening will hear this. I mention you always in my prayers. Paul prays for other people, both individuals and groups. We do not know how we are supposed to pray. Remember back to the humility in the catechism? You have to be humble, and prayer will start with an understanding that we don't know how to pray. So what do we do? We ask for help. The Holy Spirit is given to us to help us. And so if one has an attitude of humility... It should be really easy to say, Holy Spirit, help me pray. Now, can you read prayers out of a book? Yes, you should. Can you make up the prayers all on your own? Yes, you should. Should you do both? Yes, you should. And you should also ask the Holy Spirit to help you. What have I not been praying? Has your prayer not been prayers of gratitude or prayers of petition for others? There's lots of things to pray about and to pray for as your prayer life covered all of them. The Holy Spirit will help you with that. My prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. So the context of this verse is Paul is speaking about the people of Israel. He is somewhat concerned that he's been really hard on them. And yes, he has been. He's, if you read through his letters, Paul hammers some of the people of Israel. He is tough on them. And here he's still telling, though, the people of Rome that he still prays for them. 
He prays for the people who he still is, the people of Israel. He still is part of the people of Israel, even though he's now a, a Christian. He is still of, born of the family of Israel. He is a son of Abraham, and he prays for his people. Be constant in prayer. Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in your trials, your tribulations. Be constant in prayer. Consistency in prayer is a common theme that Paul talks about a lot. He is always talking about this. Consistency in one's actions, consistency in one's relationship with God. Talk to God. Listen to God. Be consistent in this. In your prayers to God on my behalf, Paul is humble. Why? Because he's asking other people to pray for him. It doesn't matter what we are doing in our lives, what our problems are, big or small, we need to be the same way. Ask someone to pray for you. It takes some humility to do that, doesn't it? We don't want to tell other people our problems, our issues. We don't want to share those things. We just want to hide them, keep them inside. But Paul Paul doesn't do that. He asks them specifically, Strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Paul knows with all the gifts Paul has been given, right, compared to the gifts we've been given, right, he's going to be given a lot more than we have. With all his gifts, he still is humble enough to ask for help. What am I to do? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the mind also. So the context of this, 1 Corinthians 14, Paul's talking about praying in tongues. So without getting into any any details there, Paul is joyful in his prayer. So prayer is our relationship with God. It's not a duty or an obligation, something we, oh, I have to do this, right? He's joyful in it. He is joyful in experiencing his relationship with his father, with Jesus' his brother, with the Holy Spirit. I pray with the Spirit. I pray with the mind. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the mind. So he is praying and singing, and they are sort of one together. His prayer is a song, a song of joy. You also must help us by prayer. So now this time it's to the Corinthians again. Again being humble and asking for help. The context of this one is the people of Corinth have been giving food, their charity, to other people. So the generosity of your contribution for them... In that generosity, they, the people you gave the food to, have been praying for you. They didn't pay them back with money. They paid them back with prayer. Because that's what Christians did early in the church. There were Christians who had some money and Christians who didn't have money, just like today. And those who didn't have money repaid those who gave them food with prayer. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. What we pray for is your improvement. Improvement, growth as disciples of Jesus. So Paul is praying for something specific. Praying for us that we grow as disciples. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Paul's always doing this. 
<coughs> multiple times he makes comments on this. I remember you in my prayers. Pray at all times in the Spirit, which means let God help you pray. Making supplication for all the saints. Okay, so saints in a capital S, saints in a small s. Saints in a capital S, we would understand today as those in heaven. But Paul uses saints with a lowercase s here, all the Christians. So Paul would call all of us saints, lowercase s. When you get to heaven, you're a saint with a capital S. Okay, there's the difference between the two. But heaven starts now, right? Famous book, fabulous author, right? Heaven starts now, so we are saints now. So, pray, making supplication for all the saints. Pray for all of us. Pray for all us, one of us, another. Pray for all the saints, us. Always in every prayer of mine for you, all, making my prayer with joy. Again, Paul and his joy. Right? Joy is a gift from God. It's not a marketing slogan used to sell stuff. Right? That's what it is in our society. Joy. Buy this car, it's joy. No, sorry. Joy is a gift from God. And Paul prays in that gift because he is in that relationship. Again, prayer is not a duty, an obligation. It's something we should want to do, need to do. We should experience some joy in that prayer as well. If you're not experiencing the joy, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. My prayer that your love may abound more and more. So Paul is praying that their love is going to grow. Their love for God, their love for one another. For I know that through your prayers, here the context of this, Paul is in prison. With full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And yes, I shall rejoice. Paul knows he will not be in prison forever. He will either die or he will be released. He doesn't care. Well, he does care. He wants to go to heaven. Sorry. He wants to go to heaven. He doesn't want to be in prison, but he doesn't mind. He doesn't, he doesn't even want to be released. He wants to go to heaven. He wants to die because he prays with joy. He knows his father. He knows his brother. He knows that heaven is the ultimate reward for all of us. I know that through your prayers, my deliverance, deliverance either from prison or deliverance from this life, Have no anxiety about anything. How? Why? That's a tough one, huh? We face a lot of problems in our lives, right? And lots of anxieties, lots of problems, lots of fears, lots of issues. Pray about everything. All your problems, big or small, bring them to God. And pray about them, all of them. We always thank God. Paul does a lot of prayer. And it seems like he's always mentioning, along with his prayer, that he has thanksgiving to God. No matter what the other part of the prayer is, thanksgiving is always part of that prayer. And so from the day we heard of it, that's the day that which the people of uh, the Colossians were converted, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with 
all the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So after they have been converted, Paul is praying for them so that they, they will become disciples of Jesus and do the will of the Father. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Right? Continue. Don't quit. Don't stop. Your prayer may not have been answered, or you think your prayer may not have been answered. Continue steadfastly in prayer. If 30 years is what it takes, 30 years is what it takes. The example of St. Monica, right? She prays for her son, St. Augustine, for 30 years. She continued steadfastly in prayer. Pray for us also that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Paul is asking for prayer in the success of his evangelism efforts. Paul is praying for the original evangelism, right? A papyrus who is one of yourselves, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always remembering you earnest, earnestly in his prayers. Not only does Paul pray, he knows what his other friends are praying for. So as a discipleship group, they share their prayers with one another. He knows what he, this other man is praying for. Don't pray alone. Pray with others. In a discipleship group, in a Bible study group, pray with others. Let them know what you're praying for. We give thanks to God always for you all, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Paul and others are praying as a group, right? We. Praying earnestly night and day. That, I may s that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. So Paul's not only praying for them, but that he can be with them. Again, this discipleship group. He's apart from them. He wants to come to them and be with them. But back to the night and day. Psalm 63, verse 6. When I think of you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. Night and day, Paul is praying all the time. He doesn't have a prayer hour or prayer point in the morning. In the morning and at night, pray constantly. Right? It's part of that relationship. Pray constantly. A two-word summary of St. Paul's prayer advice. Pray constantly. Brethren, pray for us, again with the humility. Again with a subtle hint of Paul's covenant theology. The brethren there is not a, a, a greeting or a, a, a term of endearment. It's an acknowledgement of who they are, brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for us. To this end, we always pray for you. We always pray for you. Again, as a community, we praying for you. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed on. Again, more prayers for the original evangelism. Prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all men. Paul's praying for all humanity. That's a big task, huh? We've got 7 billion people on this earth. You can pray for all of them. That's the mission of the church, to bring all humanity to heaven. We can pray for all of them. So it's also David's prayers, or what's the difference between... Yes, that's his form of his prayer. He uses all these different terms and these words. Mm -hmm. I desire, then, that in every place... 
that men should pray lifting the holy hands without anger or quarreling. We are to be united in our prayer. Right? One group doesn't pray for one thing and another group pray for the opposite thing. Right? That's not what we want to do. We want to be united in our prayer. And how are we united in our prayer? Our pastor tells us what to pray for. Our archbishop tells us what to pray for. Our bishop in Rome, the pope, tells us what to pray for, right? So we are to be united in that prayer. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For then it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. So he's making an allusion to Genesis 1. Everything that God creates is good, and we are to be thankful for everything. We're typically thankful for things when we pray over meals, right? Praying before breakfast and lunch and dinner. Mm -hmm. She who is a real widow and is left all alone has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. So the real widow there is a widow who has no husband and who has no children. So Paul is contrasting that with, say, a widow who has four children. 16 grandchildren, right? Big difference between a widow like that and a widow who has no children at all, right? The family is all gone. So everyone, everyone continues in supplication and prayers night and day. When I remember you constantly in my prayers, again, this theme of constantly praying and remembering others, I thank my God when I remember you in my prayers. Again, when I remember you. Here he's pr talking to a p specific person, Philemon. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may promote the knowledge of all the good that is ours in Christ. Again, praying for the new evangelism. I mean the original evangelism. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping through your prayers to be granted to you. He wants to be there with his friend. Praying for him is not enough. He wants to be there with him. St. Paul's personal spirituality. He is an apostle, a missionary, a martyr, a bishop, a spiritual father, and a disciple who is always praying. Huh? He has prayers of blessing. He prays alone and with others. He prays for individuals. He prays for groups. He's praying for other people's needs. And he always gives thanks along with all the rest of his prayers. Rather a unique and interesting feature, always giving thanks to God while he prays his other prayers. Any questions? Uh, that would have, it's thought that he, uh, he uh, was ordained by Jesus on the road to Damascus. Okay. That event, okay. yeah. Okay. That event is everything for Paul. Mm -hmm. that, the other no, it would have come directly from Jesus. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, let's uh, bow our head in our class prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. Good night, everyone. So the uh, subject of today's talk is going to be the uh, simple introduction to the theology of St. Paul. St. Paul is very difficult to understand. So to try and understand one particular verse or one particular book that he's written, it's helpful to understand everything that he's written. And so we'll look at his theology from a, from a really high level as his theology shows itself throughout all of his books or all of his letters. And so we'll start with the resurrection of Christ. 
So the appearance of the risen Christ to Paul on the road to Damascus is the key to the apostles' faith and teaching. This one event in which he encounters Jesus. Coming to us out of um, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, I think it is. This one event is the key to understanding everything about St. Paul. So Paul explicitly says here that Christ's resurrection is also the proof that we too will rise again. And the rite of immersion in the water of baptism signifies and brings about our death in Christ to sin. And the emerging of the water signals the birth of a new creature to a life of grace and to hope to a future, a glorious resurrection. So let's take a look at this from Romans 6. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So not only Paul, but Jesus also talks about this death and life. And to understand that, we have to know that he's speaking about the life of the soul. But it's not the death of the soul and the not the existence of the soul. He's talking about how the soul is alive when it is with God and how the soul is dead when it's not with God. This is distinct from the termination of the existence of the soul, right? So that's what Paul is talking about as well as the other New Testament authors. The life that we have in God is with him. But the soul is always known and you always have to think of the soul as immortal. The soul will always exist. Life is with God. Death is a life or an existence without God. That's one key point to understand Paul and his, his talking about what life is. A death like his, dying, the dying of the soul, the dying and the resurrection of the soul. You must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. So our life is in Jesus. And a life without Jesus is not life, that's death. So Jesus Christ, the only Savior. Prior to his conversion, Paul was faithful to the fundamental tenets of Judaism. God had chosen Israel as his people, who had been entrusted with the promises he made to the patriarchs, and which found expression in the covenant and the law of Moses, and who were convinced that salvation lay in observance of the law. But everything changes with Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God, and Paul must proclaim him to the world. So here we'll look at... Galatians 1, but when he who had set me apart before I was born, had called me through his grace and was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him to the Gentiles. So everything about Paul, everything that Paul knew, that he thought he knew, wasn't wrong, but it was incomplete. The old covenant that he thought he knew was incomplete, and he finds his completeness in Jesus, that a son of David, the Messiah, the anointed one, would not only be the son of David, but would also be the son of God. And so Jesus, the son of God, is the one who saves us, saves us before he was born. Paul talks about this. So God's plan to save us comes from before even the world has been created. Romans 3, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God that everyone, everyone needs Jesus. So that's Paul's theology. Everyone is in need. He himself and everyone, including all of the people of 
the old covenant. The salvific mystery. The gospel of Paul is the proclamation of God's plan for the salvation of all mankind. This plan was foretold by the prophets in the Old Testament, but it was only through Christ that it came to be revealed to the apostles. Paul describes the saving plan of God in Christ using expressions like the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of God, the mystery of faith, or simply the mystery to show that it was a truth that lay hidden until it was revealed in Christ. What was revealed to Paul was simply this, the mystery has been fulfilled in Christ. So this mystery of God wanting to save us lies hidden in the Old Testament. And Paul didn't understand that until he has the encounter with Jesus. So the mystery is God has come to save us. God himself has come to save us. So the light he receives on the road to Damascus was not, strictly speaking, a conversion to God, but an illumination showing him that the mystery of everything which happened in the Old Covenant comes now to be fulfilled in Jesus. So there's two very related parts of theology that we can use to understand Paul and his theology. One, Christology, a theological interpretation of Jesus Christ, clarifying systematically who and what he is in himself for those who believe in him. Soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. So the systematic interpretation of Christ's saving work for human beings and the world. So the difference there being Christology, who Jesus is. The soteriology, how Jesus saves us. They are very closely related, and it may be difficult at first to understand the difference, but the difference is significant to understanding Paul. Because Paul preaches not only who Jesus is, the Son of God, but he also preaches how Jesus comes to save us, why he loves us, how he loves us. Any questions on that? Yes. Going back to that again, the the illumination, the light, we have to be open to that. I mean, that's what, what I'm starting to think. Paul had to be open to receiving this light. Correct. Paul... Paul is, his, his event on the road to Damascus, Paul is a student, a great student of the Old Testament, of the Old Covenant. So he knows everything that's in there. But he's missing something. And because he has studied that Old Covenant, because he studied with great teachers, something is, yes, been prepared in him to receive this. So yes, that's a good question. He has been prepared to receive Jesus. But he didn't know it it until Jesus actually comes and sees and shows him and talks to him and has that encounter with him. So yes, he's prepared, but until he actually has that personal encounter, he's still persecuting the church. Here, another example, Ephesians 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, that's the Christology. Jesus, who is rich in mercy. Out of the great love which, which, with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespass, our sin against the, the covenant, made us alive with Christ. There's a soteriology. His saving power is through his love making us alive with Christ. See the distinction between those two? It's subtle, but it's there. It's difficult. It'll grow on you once you start thinking about it. And once you start reading through Paul's letters, you'll be able to see that distinction about who Jesus is and then how he saves us. The 
the divinity of Jesus Christ. The letters make it very clear, all of Paul's letters make it very clear that Jesus is the Son of God. And Paul uses a number of titles for Christ already found in the apostolic teaching. The Lord, the Son of God, the Savior. In Romans and in Titus, he calls Jesus God, God over all, blessed forever, and our great God. In Colossians, he speaks of Christ's having existed eternally prior to being sent into the world, prior even to the creation of the world. Jesus Christ is co-eternal with the Father and has been sent by the Father out of love for mankind. So let's look at Colossians. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So what does Paul mean by this, the firstborn of all creation? We talked about this before when I talked about the Trinity. The eternal wisdom of the Father is expressed as his word. And this word is Jesus. So God, who exists outside of time, this expression of his eternal word doesn't start, doesn't end. It just proceeds in an eternal procession. So Jesus is of the Father, begotten of the Father, not created. We say that in the creed, right? the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him. Also here, Acts 17, this is Paul talking to um, the people of Athens, I think. In him we live and move and have our being. I mean, thinking about that, in him we live and move and we have our life. In Jesus, everything about our life is in him. Every beat of your heart is a gift from God. Paul's depth of explaining that to us, everything is in Jesus. He's created everything. Again, every beat of the heart, the muscle contracting, moving blood through your body, is because it's the will of God that it happens. That's the depth of Paul and this divinity of God. Everything belongs to Jesus. It's all his. Next, the incarnation of the Son of God. The Son of God took on human form, born of a woman, born under the law. He emptied himself, and in his own flesh he condemned sin. In this way, all the elements of life that had had enslaved human beings, sin, flesh, death, law, were overcome by Christ. His death is the supreme proof of God's love for man. So the love of God starts first with, God becoming man and then showing his love to us. It's not enough that God is just up in heaven. God comes here. Romans 5, but God shows his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. So this Christ crucified, the anointed one, the son of David, the Messiah, has been crucified. For the Jews, this is a stumbling block because they thought that the son of David would be coming as a political leader and a military leader. But God doesn't do that. The incarnation of God wasn't to come here as a political leader, military leader. The incarnation of God was to come here to show us how much he loved us. Folly to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are thinking in terms of Zeus and all the other Greek gods. The Greek gods who are at war with one another and who could care less about humans. For them, 
It's folly. It is foolishness to think that God would come here to be one of us and to show his love for us. We preach Christ crucified because Jesus on a cross shows us how much he loves us. His death shows us how much he loves us. And that's the result of the incarnation. He didn't come here just to talk to us. He came here to die for us. <clears throat> justice and justification. Paul refers often to the justice or righteousness of God by which he means the saving power of God that expresses itself in Christ's work of redemption. By one, believing in Jesus, a person gains access to this redemption. Justification is the, is the word used to describe this new relationship that a human being has with God through the workings of divine grace. From the time of the Lutheran Reformation onwards, the whole question of justification and justice has become a key theme in Pauline scholarship. Some writers see it as the cornerstone of his theology. But justice and justification is the consequence of the salvific mystery of the event of Christ himself. The core of Paul's teaching, as we have said, stems from his living experience of Jesus Christ as the only Savior. Salvation reaches man through faith. Every other idea and teaching flows from this belief. For Paul, it all starts with faith. Again, this process of justification involves three stages. First, the initiative comes from God. Secondly, God wants everyone to be saved. All humanity all humanity is what God wants saved. Third, although it is God who takes the initiative and his action is the decisive force in this justification, every human being must respond personally to God's grace. So I'll use Father John's definition and expand upon it. Faith, hope, love, all grace is God's work within me to which I respond. Everything that God gives us is offered to us. And we have free will. The free will to choose to accept it or not to accept it. The free will to respond to it or not to respond to it. God does not force faith on us. He gives it. He offers it. He does not force hope on us. He does not force love on us. We respond to this offer, this gift. Questions on that? Christian life in the church. Through joining ourselves to Christ by means of faith, we become children of God. Here, Galatians 4. Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father so that through God you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir. Paul's theology is also a covenant theology. This gift that God gives us is not just to be his people, but is an individual gift. The grace of the Holy Spirit makes you his son. It makes you his daughter. It's an incredible gift. And that's a gift for you here today and for all eternity. Our existence in heaven is not as just individuals, as persons, as people. Our existence in heaven is as his son, as his daughter. And then again, the implications of this. You're his son, you're his daughter, so am I. We then are brothers and sisters. 
So all of us in heaven will share in this eternalness as brothers and sisters with one another by adoption to the same Father. And that adoption starts now and continues for all eternity. Galatians 2 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So what is Paul saying here? I have been crucified with Christ. Paul's not dying of a crucifixion. In a few years, he'll die from a Roman execution, but not a crucifixion. So what's dying in him? What's dying in him is his will. His will dies so that the will of Jesus can live in him. And the will of Jesus is to do always the will of the Father. So we as sons and daughters of the Father don't live all by ourselves, independent of our Father, we live to do the will of our Father. And that's what Paul says. His crucifixion is the death of his will to do the will of Jesus, which is the will of the Father. And lastly, the church. Of all the inspired writers of the New Testament, St. Paul is the one who speaks most often about the church and the one who delves deepest into its mystery. His insight into this mystery begins at the very moment of his conversion when he hears Jesus identify himself with Christians. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Not why do you persecute these people, this church, this movement, these individual people. It's me. Jesus is saying, me. This church is me. Again, this initial encounter for Paul with Jesus on the road to Damascus is such an incredibly important event to understand Paul. So let's look at two parts to this. Paul uses two main analogies of St. Paul to describe Jesus and his church. One, Jesus is the head and we are the body. One church, one head, one church, one body. The other analogy he uses is Jesus is the bridegroom, and we the church are the bride. Again, one bridegroom, one church, one bride, one church. Paul's theology is a unity, a unity between God and us, as well as a unity amongst ourselves. Again, going back to the covenant theology, we are brothers and sisters, and there is a unity in that, the unity of being part of one family, the unity of being part of one church. Any questions? Romans 9? Paul, talk about Paul's divinity when Paul's talking about the divinity of Christ? Eternally. Yes. Eternally. Describe that again. All right, let's talk about the 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 Trinity. God the Father has this wisdom, God's eternal wisdom. He speaks His eternal wisdom. His eternal wisdom is His Word, 
This word is the Son, which is Jesus. So God, who exists outside of time, this eternal procession of the word, which is his wisdom, doesn't start, doesn't end, it just is. Okay? So the Son is proceeding eternally from the Father. He is the Father's wisdom, the Father's word expressed. There is no start to this procession. There is no end to this procession. The procession just is. That's the eternal procession. Jesus is the Son of the Father. He is of the Father, but is not the Father because he is coming from the Father. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Paul's justification. All right, so the question there is, what does the Lutheran Reformation... The, the Protestants took the question of justice and justification, and they saw that as a key theme in understanding St. Paul. Okay. So they focus significant amounts of their time reading and understanding and trying to understand what Paul is talking about in terms of justice and justification. Yes, yes, it is a positive thing. It's not that the church, the Catholic Church, ignored it before the time of the Lutheran, Lutheran Reformation, um, 1511 or whenever that was. But there was a, a renewed emphasis brought about by the Protestants in the teaching of St. Paul. Yeah, this is probably not the place to get into that type of a discussion, but yeah, that a, a misunderstanding of what St. Paul was teaching led to that type of a, a problem in, in, in the difference in theology between Catholics and Protestants, yes. Okay, any other questions? Okay, and I think we're done for the night, and we'll uh, end with our class prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night, everyone. So the first question you might ha be having is, why are we talking about St. Augustine in a class on St. Paul? And the answer is, we don't study St. Paul for the sake of studying St. Paul. We study St. Paul for the sake of coming to know Jesus, God the Father, the Holy Spirit. Right. So now we're going to study Paul, however, indirectly because we will take a quick look at the influence of St. Paul upon St. Augustine. Okay, so that's the reason why we're doing this. So St. Augustine is born in uh, the year 354, and he dies in 430. He's about the year 400. Okay? That's when he's doing his thing. He is a, uh, a bishop of Hippo in uh, Algeria, present-day Algeria in North Africa. He is a doctor of the church. We have approximately 9,000 saints throughout the history of the church. We don't have an exact count, but about 9,000. There are some 37 of them who have this special title, Doctor of the Church, because their writings were either so great in volume or so great in their influence that the church decided to do something special for them to recognize them so that we would know to turn to them for their special help because of their, their influence on our theology and our spirituality. So St. 
Augustine also has this specific title, the Doctor of Grace. And what have we been studying inside St. Paul? Grace. Yes. So St. Paul writes 11 letters, thir- sorry, 13 letters that we have in the Bible. St. Augustine wrote 100 books, 200 letters, and he, we have recorded from him 500 sermons. He had four secretaries who, when he would give a sermon, a homily, those four secretaries would be writing away on their, their ancient manuscripts, right? Four of them to keep track of what he was doing. So, and we've got 500 of those sermons still in existence. St. Augustine is quoted more than any other person in the, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. More than any other person. So, I want to note this at the very beginning. The source for most of the information in this talk is from a book called Our Restless Heart, The Augustinian Tradition. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Um, and most of what I'm going to talk about is just out of the f- first two introductory chapters. Okay, so I don't... I, I highly recommend this book. You can t- come take a look at it after. Plus, I have a few other things, other books to talk about, too. So, when we talk about a spirituality, I want to first talk about what it is. We talked about that last week, right? It is the relationship we have. Our spirituality is the living out of our relationship. And so we use that word to describe it, spirituality. So, everybody remember um, Father Clement? Father Michael Clement Suey, right? He was a Benedictine. Okay? So you notice there was something special about his homilies, about the way he acted, the way he acted person to person as well. His Benedictine spirituality formed him as, as a priest, as a person. Our current Pope is a Jesuit. His spirituality is formed by his being a Jesuit. Pope Benedict, a Benedictine. St. John Paul the Great, he was a Carmelite. So these three popes, three different, totally different spiritualities, understanding those spiritualities helps us to understand them as a person and how they related to the world and why they do what they do and why they're all so different from one another. So these spiritualities have what is called a hallmark or many hallmarks. And those are going to be the bolded things in here. So for St. Augustine, we start with this, spirit, this hallmark of his spirituality in that he notices and writes that spirituality is a journey. So I propose that it is, it is with the notion of the journey that one finds a key to understanding and living this Augustinian spirituality. So where do we see this in the gospel? Jesus says to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So Jesus says this, I am the way, the way from where we are now to where we want to go. There's a journey happening there, right? It's not really a physical journey. It's a spiritual journey. So he comes to know this. And he knows where he's going and how he's going to get there. And he constantly directs his gaze into what this journey should be and how to do this journey. And the most important thing for us, it's a journey to be shared. And the word, the word we use for that now is evangelization. Evangelization. We share this journey. We recognize that we are on a journey from right here today to an eternity with God, and we want to share that journey with others. And so we evangelize to bring them with us from where we are now to where we are going to go. St. Paul talks about this. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are already away from the Lord. For we walk 
by faith and not by sight. Here St. Paul is talking about that spiritual journey, right? We're not walking with our sight, our physical eyes. We're walking with a faith, a belief in Jesus. We believe that Jesus is the way to heaven, to an eternity with our Father. <clears throat> Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The next hallmark of Augustinian spirituality is that it is Christocentric. Jesus is at the center of everything we do. This can indeed be looked upon as an absolute statement of the nature of Augustine's spiritual journey. It is the key to understanding St. Augustine himself. Jesus is at the center of everything we do. St. Augustine's conversion. <clears throat> His conversion is a long time coming. It's not just one particular event, but there is one specific event in which a lot happens. But he is formed by a lot of different people. St. Augustine is formed by one, St. Ambrose, who is the Bishop of Milan. Okay? So when St. Augustine reads the Bible, he doesn't understand it. The Bishop of Milan explains it to him, St. Ambrose. How would you like to have your Bible study teacher be a saint, huh? Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> I'm not a saint yet, okay? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> I'm working on it. Okay? He is also formed by his mother, St. Monica. We have her statue in our parish out there in the church. She prays for him for 30 years. That's the power of prayer. That's St. Paul's, that's Paul's pray constantly. That's St. Paul's never give up. She prays for him for 30 years. And lastly, he is formed by the Bible. Three particular parts. One, the writings of St. John, the gospel and the letters. Two, he's formed by the Psalms. And then lastly, he is formed and influenced by the writings of St. Paul. So when he has his conversion experience, he's in a garden praying. And he is struggling. Okay? The context to this is he is struggling with God and he hears a voice that tells him, take and read. Take and read. So he picks up his scroll of the Bible and he reads the first thing that he comes to. It's Romans 13. Let us then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves Becomingly, as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the, for the flesh to gratify its desires. So that verse has always been with me for the last few years. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What would that mean? How do we figure that out? Put him on like a t-shirt? so that Jesus is close to us, right? Like a second skin, right? Or perhaps put on Jesus like a sweatshirt. You know, we got the big block M, Michigan thing, so, so others can see it, right? But the Bible study here is to understand what Paul's getting at. We go back a couple of verses. Put on the armor of light, the armor of Christ, the armor of light. So Paul is here again talking about what we just talked about in Ephesians 6, right? Put on the armor as a virtue to help us know that we are disciples of Jesus and that he is here with us, close to us, defending us. This is his conversion experience. That Jesus is not just God, Jesus is here with him, on him, defending him. Right? It's not a relationship with a God who's up in heaven, is it? It's a close personal relationship where God is with him, defending him like armor. Christ speaks to our heart 
and thus our human condition with the deepest longings and desires that are God placed within. So along with that armor, there's an effect. That effect of Jesus is not just on the outside defending us, he's moving inside. For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So St. Augustine converts from being a man of the world to being a man of Jesus. His Christocentric living, everything becomes about Jesus. And it's no longer about himself. His crucifixion, as well as what Paul is speaking about here, Paul does not get crucified. Paul later on will be executed with a sword, not a crucifixion. He's a Roman citizen. So what's Paul talking about here saying he's going to be crucified? He has been crucified. It's his will. Paul's will dies. Remember that? Intellect and will. His will dies so that he can do the will of Christ. Again, this Christocentric living. Next hallmark is a love of sacred scripture. He tells us that no other passage in the Gospels moved him as much as Matthew 25. I was hungry and you gave me to eat. Okay? So the context of Matthew 25 is the judgment of the nations. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, O blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. So again, no other passage of the Gospels moved him as much as this one. So how would he have seen this, and how would he have been moved by this? Two ways. One, he is moved that the you is him that he has to be doing this. He has to be the one giving food. He has to be the one giving drink. Right? He has to be the one welcoming, clothing, visiting. Right? These things don't happen through some government program. They happen through us. And the second way in which he is moved, I, Jesus, was hungry. I, Jesus, was thirsty. I, Jesus, was a stranger. I, Jesus, was naked. I, Jesus, was sick. I, Jesus, was in prison. Understanding what Jesus is talking about here, Jesus is identifying himself with the poor and the outcasts of society. And Augustine sees this, and he is moved to know who Jesus is in the outcast of his society, and then he is moved to do something about it. St. Augustine's book, The Confessions, perhaps the most read religious book other than the Bible. The first words of this book are Psalm 42. You are great, Lord, and highly to be praised. The final words are a paraphrase of Matthew 7, a text which appears again and again throughout all of Augustine's writings. Only you. Only you. Throughout all of his writings. That's the Christocentric understanding of his spirituality. Only Jesus. Nothing else. In his book, The Confessions, Augustine does two things. One, he confesses his sin. Can you imagine that? Confessing every sin you ever did in your life, writing writing it in a book, and then people for the next 1,600 years are going to be reading about that sin. And it's not just a book, a dusty old book in one library in South Australia that no one reads, right? 
one of the most read or the most read religious books throughout all of history. He confesses his sin and puts it in a book on display for everyone to read. Wow. It's, it's stunning. And then the second part he confesses is love for God. We have a difficulty in getting people to come to Mass where they, within the confines of one little building where no one else can see them to confess their love for God, right? 33%, one-third of Catholics come to Mass to confess their love for God in a building in which they're hidden from the world? And he confesses his love for God in a book read for 1,600 years. Quite the contrast, isn't it? That's why he's a saint, a doctor of the church. And that's why we learn from him. May your scriptures be my pure delight. Augustine's spirituality is a biblical spirituality drawn from the word's profoundest depths. So for the last eight weeks, we've been studying some of these depths, right? But there was just six short little chapters in one short little letter from 13 from St. Paul, and there's a lot more to go, right? <laughs> there's a lot more to go. Another hallmark of Augustinian spirituality, the heart and interiority. Look inward, brethren, and in everything you do, see God as your witness. Look inward into our soul. Right? We're not looking inward with a chest x-ray right, to see the condition of the heart or the lungs. The spirituality is to look at the condition of the soul, our immortal soul. And we need to do that through quiet time. We can't do that with the noise that this world has, right? Jesus tells us, go to your inner room and close the door. Go down to the adoration chapel in the quietness there and turn inward. A real good example of this uh, from the Old Testament First Kings. The context is Elijah, who is uh, living in a cave in the wilderness at Mount Horeb, which is also known as Mount Sinai. And lo and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, and the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a small, a still, small voice. Right? To hear that still, small voice, we have to turn inward, this interiority. And in the quiet, we can hear that still, small voice because God, our Father, Jesus, our brother, and the Holy Spirit want to talk to us. And that's how they talk, in that still, small voice that we hear in our interiority. <clears throat> the heart is the organ of faith, and so to believe for St. Augustine means to discover and respond to the presence of God deep within the human heart. God is there. St. Paul tells us, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is alive inside you. He's there. You have to go and find him. In effect, the heart has become a trademark of Augustinian spirituality. So this is the official uh, image of the order of St. Augustine. So you see a book there. That book is the Bible. You see a heart there. That's our heart. The flame on top of it, that's the flame Jesus gives us in grace. And that arrow piercing the heart, that's the Holy Spirit. The heart symbolizes for Augustine that the God-inspired journey is a graced and ongoing journey that takes us inward to the interior self, 
my God self, away from what he calls in classic Pauline fashion, the exterior self. See Corinthians 2. Well, let's take a look at that. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer man is wasting away, the inner man is being renewed every day. Once I read that one, I love that one. The outer man is wasting away. Yes. Getting old, gray hair, wrinkles, a couple spots of skin cancer. You know what? The outer man is wasting away. But the inner man, what does he refer to there? That's the immortal soul. The immortal soul is not wasting away. Through the grace that God gives us, the immortal soul is growing stronger. See the difference and the contrast there between the two? St. Augustine's most famous quote. You have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. So whether we know this or not, or whether we admit this or not, we all have the same thing, a restless heart. In all of us, all humanity has this. This is how Augustine perceives this heart. It refers to our whole self before God. The restlessness of the heart is thus the restless undertow of the image of God, not allowing us to be satisfied by anything less than God. Remember, we are created in the image and likeness of God, Genesis chapter 1. So God's image is in us, and that his image in us makes it such that we were created so that only God can satisfy this restlessness that we have. Only God can do that. Only God can give us what our ultimate destiny is supposed to be, and that is he himself. The things of this earth will not satisfy our hearts. We find that only in God. Now there's a tension here. So a tension in spirituality is a conflict between two things. And the conflict between the two things is this interiority versus going out and living. Yet for all this talk of heart and its emphasis on interiority, its intention is never meant to lead to an introverted spirituality. The heart is never the final goal, yet what does not start from the heart goes nowhere. The order of St. Augustine is a medicant order and not a contemplative. Medicant means they go out into the world and they do things. They evangelize. They bring the gospel to others. They go out and heal people. They go out and talk to people. They go out and pray to people. They go out and visit the sick, the poor, the dying, the naked, the homeless. But to do that and to be effective in going out into the world, we have to start with the interiority and we have to start with the prayer and we have to start with the depth of a relationship with Jesus which enables us to go out and be effective in what we're doing. For instance, the PBJ ministry. We don't just go out and give sandwiches, right? They go down there and they pray with people. They give them hope. They give them faith. They give them love, respect. Right? It's not a ministry of giving out sandwiches. It's a ministry of giving out a, a relationship with Jesus by being an example of what love is for these people who have next to nothing. That's a medicant order. They are out in the world. So the order of St. Augustine has a rule. Um, the rule is five short chapters, five pages. 
100 years later, St. Benedict writes a rule that is about 80 pages long. So it's much, much longer. St. Augustine's is much simpler. And I picked out one thing from that rule to share with you. This is from chapter 2, the, the uh, chapter on prayer. When you pray to God in psalms and hymns, think over in your hearts the words that come from your lips. So prayer is not a hot air blowing over your vocal cords, causing them to move and make sound, right? That's not prayer. Prayer is what comes out of your heart, what you are thinking, right? We're not just repeating prayers for the sake of repeating prayers, right? It's not an act of the vocal cords, not an act of the body. The prayer is an act of one's soul coming out of your heart. Remember again, in biblical language, the heart is the, is the innermost part of our person. Think of the heart as representing the soul. Okay? That's where prayer comes from. Your eternalness of your soul, not from vocal cords that are vibrating. Right? Another hallmark of his spirituality, providence. A strong belief in an active and comprehensive involvement of God in our lives. For other uh, types of spirituality, their belief in providence is not quite as strong, perhaps not even strong at all. For an, for an Augustinian, God is active and he is strongly influencing and working in our lives. It's not a bunch of random chance events of things that are happening. God is at work. You have a freedom of will, but God is doing all sorts of things to try and get you to do what he wants you to do, to be the sons and daughters that he wants us to be. So what is providence? A Latin word from foresight. God's all-wise, all-loving, all-encompassing guidance of nature, history, and the course of individual lives. The Christian doctrine of providence allows for both human freedom and the mysterious ways of God. That's from the book, A Concise Dictionary of Theology. <clears throat> Another hallmark, St. Augustine's spirituality is Trinitarian. Remember the definition I gave for you on the Trinity? The eternal procession? That's from St. Augustine. Shall I cover that again? God's eternal wisdom is expressed as his word. His word is his son, Jesus. God's eternalness, in God's eternalness, this expression of his son as his word does not start, does not end, it just is. The procession is always going, always. Never starts, never ends. God the Father loves his son. The son loves his father. That love never starts, never ends. That love just is. But that love for the Father, for the Son, and the love for the Son of the, of the Son for the Father is so strong, so powerful, so real, so tangible. It is the third person of the Trinity. That's St. Augustine's definition, eternal procession. And so we need to have an understanding and a knowledge of God is a trinity of persons. And so we have a relationship with God the Father, a relationship with God the Son, a relationship with God the Holy Spirit. Next, love. And I got two quotes from here, not from the book. God is love, and he who lives in love lives in God and God in him. 1 John chapter 4. To abide means to remain in the same place over a period of time. So to abide, think about this from a practical point. We don't abide in God just one hour a week when we go to Mass, right? 168 hours in a week. We abide in God the whole 168 hours. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
this, I, I included this one in case you do not know, this is the most quoted, most underlined, highlighted, most known, most quoted, most spoken about verse out of the entire Bible. So if you don't have a favorite verse out of the Bible, perhaps you pick this one. If you have nothing memorized out of the Bible, perhaps you'll pick this one. And lastly, the primacy of grace. From Sermon 17, all is grace, singular and perfect grace. For Augustine exclaims with Paul, what do we have that we have not received? The grace of Christ appears 430 times in Augustine's writings. The grace of Christ, 430 times. I think that's a pretty important topic for him, huh? For Augustine, the issue of grace is simply a consequence of the centrality of Christ for humanity. Christ just doesn't come here to love us, but his love is given to us. Right? Love is not a feeling or an emotion. Love is an act of the will. Love is a gift. St. Augustine writes and comments about this one verse more than any other, Romans 5.5. 5. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So let's break this down. God's love, that would be the Holy Spirit, has been poured into our hearts. When you see that poured into your hearts, God does not pour his love with a teacup. The image I want you to have is Niagara Falls. All right. Now, how can you think that this body is going to absorb Niagara Falls? Well, the gift of God's love is given to our immortal soul. And the immortal soul is going to be able to absorb all that water, all that love, all that grace. But you've got to know that. That's how much God's going to love you. That image, Niagara Falls, the love of God being poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, given to us in the grace of every sacrament. A one-sentence summary of all of St. Augustine, the sovereign God of grace, in the sovereign grace of God. So God, who is love, isn't just love by himself up there, up in heaven. His love is given to us. It's given. The grace of God, it is given away freely, undeservedly. Given away to us, and he wants to give it away to all humanity. And that's why we evangelize. So a summary, all the hallmarks of, August, of uh, Augustine spirituality. It is a journey, Christocentric, a love of sacred scripture, an interiority. It is medicant. They are out in the world. Providence, Trinitarian, love, and the primacy of grace. Again, the source for most of this talk, our restless heart, the Augustinian tradition, I'm not trying to convert you to be an Augustinian. I want to give you an example of what a spirituality is. From this book, Paths to Prayer, a field guide to 10 Catholic traditions. If you don't know what a Benedictine spirituality or a Franciscan spirituality Hallmarks of it, marked by a devotion to Christ. Franciscan spirituality is marked by its simplicity. Franciscan spirituality is marked by a commitment to a God-centered poverty. Emphasizes service and hospitality to others, especially the poor. Franciscan spirituality reminds us of the oneness of all people. So if you don't know your spirituality... A book like this will help you discover what it is. 
so that you can have an, an order, a structure, a knowledge of how to help you get through your life, how to help you get through your days, your, your weeks. Um, along with uh, books on the spirituality itself, you can find these in Catholic bookstores. Augustine Day by Day, it's a prayer book. 365 prayers, one for every single day of the year. And they'll have these prayer books for each of the different spiritualities, and they'll focus on drawing you in and helping you understand what that spirituality is, whether it's Carmelite, Franciscan, Augustinian, Benedictine, whatever it might be. <coughs> also books on, books on prayer. So there'll be a book specifically teaching about how that prayer is, in addition, again, like the day-by-day -day prayers, some, something helpful to help you in your prayer every day. Um, any questions? At the beginning of your talk, you defined spirituality as a relationship of, and I missed the last part. How we live our lives, our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. So it's how our spirituality is how we live the relationship. Okay? So it's not just that we have a relationship, but it's how we live that relationship with God, with God and with each other. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you, everyone. It's been a wonderful eight weeks. It's been my pleasure. Uh, my pleasure and an honor to uh, help share the Word of God with you. And uh, let's end with our class prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good night, everyone. Amen.